The space race was a 20th century competition between two Cold War rivals, the Soviet Union and the United States, for supremacy in space flight capability. The technological superiority required for such supremacy was seen as necessary for national security, and symbolic of ideological superiority. The space race spawned pioneering efforts to launch artificial satellites, unmanned probes at the Moon, Venus and Mars, and human spaceflight in low Earth orbit and to the Moon. It began on August 2, 1955, when the Soviet Union responded to the United States announcement four days earlier of intent to launch artificial satellites for the International Geophysical Year, by declaring they would also launch a satellite in the near future. The Soviets won the first lap with the October 4, 1957 launch of Sputnik 1. The race reached its zenith with the July 20, 1969 U.S. landing of the first humans on the Moon on Apollo 11, and concluded in a period of dark copyright tent with the April 1972 agreement on a cooperative Apollo-Soyuz test project, which resulted in the July 1975 meeting in Earth orbit of a U.S. astronaut crew with a Soviet cosmonaut crew. The space race had its origins in the missile-based arms race that occurred following World War II, when both the Soviet Union and the United States captured advanced German rocket technology and personnel. The space race sparked increases in spending on education and pure research, which led to beneficial spin-off technologies. An unforeseen effect was that the space race contributed to the birth of the environmental movement by providing sharp color images of the global Earth taken by astronauts in translunar space. Origins, World War II The space race can trace its origins to Germany, beginning in the 1930s and continuing during World War II when Nazi Germany researched and built operational ballistic missiles. Starting in the early 1930s, during the last stages of the Weimar Republic, German aerospace engineers experimented with liquid-fueled rockets, with the goal that one day they would be capable of reaching high altitudes and traversing long distances. The head of the German Army's Ballistics and Munitions Branch, Lieutenant Colonel Karl Emil Becker, gathered a small team of engineers that included Walter Dornberger and Leo Zornsen, to figure out how to use rockets as long-range artillery in order to get around the Treaty of Versailles ban on research and development of long-range cannons. Werner von Braun, a young engineering prodigy, was recruited by Becker and Dornberger to join their secret army program at Kummersdorf West in 1932. Von Braun had dreams about conquering outer space with rockets, and did not initially see the military value in missile technology. During the Second World War, General Dornberger was the military head of the Army's rocket program. Zornsen became the commandant of the PNEMA 1 quarter NDE Army Rocket Center, and von Braun was the technical director of the ballistic missile program. They would lead the team that built the Aggregate 4 rocket, which became the first vehicle to reach outer space during its test flight program in 1942 and 1943. By 1943, Germany began mass producing the A4 as the Virgil Tanks Waffe II, a ballistic missile with a 320 km range carrying a 1,130 kg warhead at 4,000 km per hour. Its supersonic speed meant there was no defense against it, and radar detection provided little warning. Germany used the weapon to bombard southern England and parts of Allied liberated Western Europe from 1944 until 1945. After the war, the V-2 became the basis of early American and Soviet rocket designs. At war's end, American, British, and Soviet scientific intelligence teams competed to capture Germany's rocket engineers along with the German rockets themselves and the designs on which they were based. Each of the Allies captured a share of the available members of the German rocket team, but the United States benefited the most with Operation Paperclip recruiting von Braun and most of his engineering team, who later helped develop the American missile and space exploration programs. The United States also acquired a large number of complete V-2 rockets. Rocket teams assembled. The German rocket center and PNEMA 1 quarter NDE was located in the eastern part of Germany, which became the Soviet zone of occupation. On Stalin's orders, the Soviet Union sent its best rocket engineers to this region to see what they could salvage for future weapons systems. The Soviet rocket engineers were led by Sergei Korolev. 
He had been involved in space clubs and early Soviet rocket design in the 1930s, but was arrested in 1938 during Joseph Stalin's Great Purge and imprisoned for six years in Siberia. After the war, he became the USSR's chief rocket and spacecraft engineer, essentially the Soviet counterpart to von Braun. His identity was kept a state secret throughout the Cold War, and he was identified publicly only as the chief designer. In the West, his name was only officially revealed when he died in 1966. After almost a year in the area around Pianima 1 quarter NDE, Soviet officials moved most of the captured German rocket specialists to Gorodomli Island on Lake Zilija, about 240 kilometers northwest of the Moscow. They were not allowed to participate in Soviet missile design, but were used as problem-solving consultants to the Soviet engineers. They helped in the following areas, the creation of a Soviet version of the A-4. Work on organizational schemes. Research in improving the A-4 main engine. Development of a 100-ton engine. Assistance in the layout of plant production rooms. And preparation of rocket assembly using German components. With their help, particularly Helmut Groe Troops Group, Korolev reverse engineered the A4 and built his own version of the rocket, the A1, in 1948. Later, he developed his own distinct designs, though many of these designs were influenced by the Groe Troop Group's G4A10 design from 1949. The Germans were eventually repatriated in 1951 a Euro 53. In America, Von Braun and his team were sent to the United States Army's White Sands Proving Ground, located in New Mexico, in 1945. They set about assembling the captured V-2S and began a program of launching them and instructing American engineers in their operation. These tests led to the first rocket to take photos from outer space, and the first two-stage rocket, the WAC Corporal V-2 combination, in 1949. The German rocket team was moved from Fort Bliss to the Army's new Redstone Arsenal, located in Huntsville, Alabama, in 1950. From here, von Braun and his team would develop the Army's first operational medium-range ballistic missile, the Redstone rocket, that would, in slightly modified versions, launch both America's first satellite, and the first piloted Mercury space missions. It became the basis for both the Jupiter and Saturn family of rockets. Cold War Arms Race The Cold War developed between two former allies, the Soviet Union and the United States, soon after the end of the Second World War. It involved a continuing state of political conflict, military tension, proxy wars, and economic competition, primarily between the Soviet Union and its satellite states, and the powers of the Western world, particularly the United States. Although the primary participants' military forces never clashed directly, they expressed this conflict through military coalitions, strategic conventional force deployments, extensive aid to states deemed vulnerable, proxy wars, espionage, propaganda, a nuclear arms race, and economic and technological competitions, such as the space race. In simple terms, the Cold War can be viewed as an expression of the ideological struggle between communism and capitalism. The United States faced a new uncertainty beginning in September 1949, when it lost its monopoly on the atomic bomb. American intelligence agencies discovered that the Soviet Union had exploded its first atomic bomb, with a consequence that the United States potentially could face a future nuclear war that, for the first time, might devastate its cities. Given this new danger, the United States participated in an arms race with the Soviet Union that included development of the hydrogen bomb, as well as intercontinental strategic bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. A new fear of communism and its sympathizers swept the United States during the 1950s, which devolved into paranoid McCarthyism. With communism spreading in China, Korea, and Eastern Europe, Americans came to feel so threatened that popular and political culture condoned extensive witch hunts to expose communist spies. Part of the American reaction to the Soviet atomic and hydrogen bomb tests included maintaining a large air force, under the control of the Strategic Air Command. SAC employed intercontinental strategic bombers, 
as well as medium bombers based close to Soviet airspace that were capable of delivering nuclear payloads. For its part, the Soviet Union harbored fears of invasion. Having suffered at least 27 million casualties during World War II after being invaded by Nazi Germany in 1941, the Soviet Union was wary of its former ally, the United States, which until late 1949 was the sole possessor of atomic weapons. The United States had used these weapons operationally during World War II, and it could use them again against the Soviet Union, laying waste its cities and military centers. Since the Americans had a much larger air force than the Soviet Union, and the United States maintained advance air bases near Soviet territory, in 1947 Stalin ordered the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles in order to counter the perceived American threat. In 1953, Korolev was given the go-ahead to develop the R-7 Semyuka rocket, which represented a major advance from the German design. Although some of its components still resembled the German G-4, the new rocket incorporated stage design, a completely new control system, and a new fuel. It was successfully tested on August 21, 1957 and became the world's first fully operational ICBM the following month. It would later be used to launch the first satellite into space, and derivatives would launch all piloted Soviet spacecraft. The United States had multiple rocket programs divided among the different branches of the American Armed Services, which meant that each force developed its own ICBM program. The Air Force initiated ICBM research in 1945 with the MX-774. However, its funding was cancelled and only three partially successful launches were conducted in 1947. In 1951, the Air Force began a new ICBM program called MX-1593, and by 1955 this program was receiving top priority funding. The MX-1593 program evolved to become the Atlas A, with its maiden launch occurring on June 11, 1957, becoming the first successful American ICBM. Its upgraded version, the Atlas D rocket, would later serve as an operational nuclear ICBM and be used as the orbital launch vehicle for Project Mercury and the remote-controlled Ajna target vehicle used in Project Gemini. With the Cold War as an engine for change in the ideological competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, a coherent space policy began to take shape in the United States during the late 1950s. Korolev would take much inspiration from the competition as well, achieving many firsts to counter the possibility that the United States might prevail. Early Space Race, 1950s, Beginnings, in 1955, with both the United States and the Soviet Union building ballistic missiles that could be utilized to launch objects into space, the starting line was drawn for the space race. In separate announcements, just four days apart, both nations publicly announced that they would launch artificial Earth satellites by 1957 or 1958. On July 29, 1955, James C. Hagerty, President Dwight D. Eisenhower's press secretary, announced that the United States intended to launch small Earth-circling satellites between July 1, 1957 and December 31, 1958 as part of their contribution to the International Geophysical Year. Four days later, at the 6th Congress of International Astronautical Federation in Copenhagen, scientist Leonid I. Sedov spoke to international reporters at the Soviet Embassy, and announced his country's intention to launch a satellite as well, in the near future. On August 30, 1955, Korolev managed to get the Soviet Academy of Sciences to create a commission whose purpose was to beat the Americans into Earth orbit. This was the de facto start date for the space race. Initially, President Eisenhower was worried that a satellite passing above a nation at over 100 kilometers might be construed as violating that nation's sovereign airspace. He was concerned that the Soviet Union would accuse the Americans of an illegal overflight, thereby scoring a propaganda victory at his expense. Eisenhower and his advisers believed that a nation's airspace sovereignty did not extend into outer space, acknowledged as the Car RMAN line, and he used the 1957 Euro 58 International Geophysical Year launches to establish this principle in international law. 
Eisenhower also feared that he might cause an international incident and be called a warmonger if he were to use military missiles as launchers. Therefore he selected the untried Naval Research Laboratory's Vanguard rocket, which was a research-only booster. This meant that von Braun's team was not allowed to put a satellite into orbit with their Jupiter C rocket, because of its intended use as a future military vehicle. On September 20, 1956, von Braun and his team did launch a Jupiter C that was capable of putting a satellite into orbit, but the launch was used only as a suborbital test of nose cone re entry technology. First artificial satellites Corolla received word about von Braun's 1956 Jupiter C test, but thinking it was a satellite mission that failed, he expedited plans to get his own satellite in orbit. Since his R 7 was substantially more powerful than any of the American boosters, he made sure to take full advantage of this capability by designing Object D as his primary satellite. It was given the designation D, to distinguish it from other R 7 payload designations A, B, B, and G, which were nuclear weapon payloads. Object D would dwarf the proposed American satellites by having a weight of 1,400 kilograms of which 300 kilograms would be composed of scientific instruments that would photograph the Earth, take readings on radiation levels, and check on the planet's magnetic field. However, things were not going along well with the design and manufacturing of the satellite, so in February 1957, Korolev sought and received permission from the USSR Council of Ministers to create a Prostyshi Sputnik, or simple satellite. The Council also decreed that Object D be postponed until April 1958. The new Sputnik was a shiny spherical ball that would be a much lighter craft, weighing 83.8 kilograms and having a 58 centimeter diameter. The satellite would not contain the complex instrumentation that Object D had, but it did have two radio transmitters operating on different shortwave radio frequencies the ability to detect if a meteoroid were to penetrate its pressure hull and the ability to detect the density of the Earth's thermosphere. Korolev was buoyed by the first successful launches of his R-7 rocket in August and September, which paved the way for him to launch his Sputnik. Word came that the Americans were planning to announce a major breakthrough at an International Geophysical Year conference at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C., with a paper entitled Satellite Over the Planet, on October 6, 1957. Korolev's fear was that von Braun might launch a Jupiter C with a satellite payload on or around the 4th or 5th of October, in conjunction with the paper. The fear of being beaten made him hasten the launch, moving it to the 4th of October. The launch vehicle for PS1 was a modified R7 a Euro vehicle 8K71 PS number M1 Psar Euro without much of the test equipment and radio gear that was present in the previous launches. It arrived at the Soviet missile base Turitam in September and was prepared for its mission at launch site No. 1. On Friday, October 4, 1957, at exactly 10.28 and 34 seconds a p.m. Moscow time, the R-7, with the now-named Sputnik 1 satellite, lifted off the launch pad, and placed this artificial moon into an orbit a few minutes later. This fellow traveler, as the name is translated in English, was a small, beeping ball, less than two feet in diameter and weighing less than 200 pounds. But the celebrations were muted at the launch control center until the downrange Far East tracking station at Kamkatka received the first distinctive beeper. Beeper. Beep sounds from Sputnik 1's radio transmitters, indicating that it was on its way to completing its first orbit. About 95 minutes after launch, the satellite flew over its launch site and its radio signals were picked up by the engineers and military personnel at Tura Tam, that's when Korolev and his team celebrated the first successful artificial satellite placed into Earth orbit. The Soviet success caused public controversy in the United States, and Eisenhower ordered the civilian rocket and satellite project, Vanguard, to move up its timetable and launch its satellite much sooner than originally planned. The December 6, 1957 Project Vanguard launch failure occurred at Cape Canaveral in front of a live broadcast television audience in the United States. It was a monumental failure, exploding a few seconds after launch, and it became an international joke. 
the satellite appeared in newspapers under the names Flopnik, Staputnik, Kaputnik, and Dudnik. In the United Nations, the Russian delegate offered the U.S. representative aid under the Soviet program of technical assistance to backwards nations. Only in the wake of this very public failure did von Braun's Redstone team get the go-ahead to launch their Jupiter-C rocket as soon as they could. Nearly four months after the launch of Sputnik 1, von Braun and the United States successfully launched its first satellite, on a modified Redstone booster, under the civilian name Juno-1 to differentiate it from the Army's Redstone missile. Explorer-1 was the first successful American satellite. It was launched at Cape Canaveral in Florida on January 31, 1958. It was 4, 8 kg in mass and was launched on a four-stage Juno-1 vehicle. It carried a micrometeorite gauge and a Geiger Ma one-quarter layer tube. It passed in and out of the Earth-encompassing radiation belt with its 360 km by 2534 km orbit therefore saturating the tube's capacity and proving what Dr. James Van Allen, a space scientist at the University of Iowa, had previously only theorized. It not only confirmed his theory, but also brought him to fame. Said radiation belt is actually now known as the Van Allen Radiation Belt. This belt consists of a donut-shaped zone of high-level radiation intensity around the Earth above the magnetic equator. Van Allen was also the man who designed and built the satellite instrumentation of Explorer 1. It was because of the previous failure of the Vanguard rocket of December 1957 that scientists made the decision of using a military rocket allowing the successful launch of the satellite. The satellite actually measured three phenomena. They are cosmic ray and radiation levels, the temperature in the spacecraft and finally the frequency of collisions with micrometeorites. The satellite had no space for data storage though which meant that it had to transmit continuously. A couple of months later in March 1958, a second satellite was sent into orbit with augmented cosmic ray instrument. Space Race in the 1960s, First Humans in Space by 1959 American observers believed that the Soviet Union would be the first to get a human into space, because of the time needed to prepare for Project Mercury's first launch. On April 12, 1961, the USSR launched Yuri Gagarin into orbit around the Earth on Vostok 1. They dubbed Gagarin the first cosmonaut, roughly translated from Russian and Greek as sailor of the universe. Although he had the ability to take over manual control of his spacecraft in an emergency by opening an envelope he had in the cabin that contained a code that could be typed into the computer, it was flown in an automatic mode as a precaution. Medical science at the time did not know what would happen to a human in the weightlessness of space. Vostok 1 orbited the Earth for 108 minutes and made its re-entry over the Soviet Union, with Gagarin ejecting from the spacecraft at 7,000 meters and landing by parachute. Under FAR copyright DAO copyright rational copyright Ronaltique International FAI qualifying rules for aeronautical records, pilots must both take off and land with their craft, so the Soviet Union kept the landing procedures secret until 1978, when they finally admitted that Gagarin did not land with his spacecraft. When the flight was publicly announced, it was celebrated around the world as a great triumph, not just for the Soviet Union but for all mankind yet it once again shocked and embarrassed the United States. The United States called their space travelers astronauts, and it was three weeks later, on May 5, 1961, when Alan Shepard became the first American in space, launched on a suborbital mission Mercury Redstone 3, in a spacecraft named Freedom 7. Though he did not achieve orbit, Unlike Gagarin he was the first person to exercise manual control over his spacecraft's attitude and retro-rocket firing. The first Soviet cosmonaut to exercise manual control was Amantitov in Vostok 2 on August 6, 1961. Almost a year after the Soviet Union put a human into orbit, astronaut John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, on February 20, 1962. His Mercury Atlas 6 mission completed three orbits in the Friendship 7 spacecraft, and splashed down safely in the Atlantic Ocean, after a tense re-entry, due to what falsely appeared from the telemetry data to be a loose heat shield. Kennedy launches the moon race. 
Despite Kennedy's famous decision to send an American to the moon, this was never a foregone conclusion. Jerome Isner of MIT, who served as a science advisor to both Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy, remarked, if Kennedy could have opted out of a big space program without hurting the country in his judgment, he would have. In March 1961, when NASA Administrator James E. Webb submitted a budget request to fund a moon landing before 1970, Kennedy rejected it because it was simply too expensive. On April 20, 1961, about one week after Gagarin's flight, American President John F. Kennedy sent a memo to Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, asking him to look into the state of America's space program, and into programs that could offer NASA the opportunity to catch up. Johnson responded about one week later, concluding that the United States needed to do much more to reach a position of leadership. Johnson recommended that a piloted moon landing was far enough in the future that it was likely that the United States could achieve it first. On May 25, Kennedy announced his support for the Apollo program and redefined the ultimate goal of the space race in an address to a special joint session of Congress, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. His overall support of NASA and the space program was unexpected because of how often he attacked the administration's inefficiency during the election. His justification for the moon race was both that it was vital to national security and that it would focus the nation's energies in other scientific and social fields. He expressed his reasoning in his We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, on September 12, 1962, before a large crowd at Rice University Stadium, in Houston, Texas, near the site of the future Johnson Space Center. Proposed joint U.S.-U.S.S.A. Moon program, on September 20, 1963, in a speech before the United Nations General Assembly, President Kennedy proposed that the United States and the Soviet Union join forces in their efforts to reach the moon. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev initially rejected Kennedy's proposal. However, during the next few weeks he concluded that both nations might realize cost benefits and technological gains from a joint venture. Khrushchev was poised to accept Kennedy's proposal at the time of Kennedy's assassination in November 1963. Khrushchev and Kennedy had developed a measure of rapport during their years as leaders of the world's two superpowers, especially during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. That trust was lacking with Vice President Johnson. When Johnson assumed the presidency after Kennedy's assassination, Khrushchev dropped the idea of a joint moon program. Vostoks and Voskhods. The Soviet Union achieved another first, with the first dual piloted flights, Vostok 3 and Vostok 4 on August 11, the Euro 15, 1962. The two spacecraft came within approximately 6.5 kilometers of one another, close enough for radio communication. The launching of two spacecraft from the same pad during a very short period of time represented a significant technical accomplishment but there was no capability for the spacecraft to maneuver closer to each other, and over the course of the mission they continued to drift as far as 2,850 kilometers apart. The Soviet Union achieved yet another first when it launched not only the first woman, but also the first civilian, in space, Valentina Tereshkova, on June 16, 1963, in Vostok 6. Launching a woman was reportedly Korolev's idea, and it was accomplished purely for propaganda value. Tarish Cover was one of a small core of female cosmonauts who were amateur parachutists, but Tarish Cover was the only one to fly. The USSR didn't again open its cosmonaut corps to women until 1980, two years after the United States opened its astronaut corps to women. Korolev had planned further, long term missions for the Vostok spacecraft and had four Vostoks in various stages of fabrication in late 1963 at his OKB-1 facilities. At that time, the Americans announced their ambitious plans for the Project Gemini flight schedule. These plans included major advancements in spacecraft capabilities, including a two-person spacecraft, the ability to change orbits, the capacity to perform an extravehicular activity, and the goal of docking with another spacecraft. These represented major advances over the previous Mercury or Vostok spaceships, 
and Korolev felt the need to try to beat the Americans to many of these innovations. Korolev already had begun designing the Vostok's replacement, the next generation Soyuz spacecraft, a multi cosmonaut spacecraft that had at least the same capabilities as the Gemini spacecraft. However, Soyuz would not be available for at least three years, and it could not be called upon to deal with this new American challenge in 1964 or 1965. Political pressure in early 1964 Euro, which some sources claim was from Khrushchev while other sources claim was from other Communist Party officials a Euro pushed him to modify his four remaining Vostoks to beat the Americans to new space firsts in the size of flight crews, and the duration of missions. On October 12, 1964, the chief designer delivered another Soviet space first when Voskhod 1 launched the first multi-person spacecraft, with three cosmonauts in a modified Vostok spacecraft. The USS had touted another technological achievement during this mission, it was the first space flight during which cosmonauts performed in a shirt-leave environment. However, flying without spacesuits was not due to safety improvements in the Soviet spacecraft's environmental systems. Rather this innovation was accomplished because the craft's limited cabin space did not allow for spacesuits. Flying without spacesuits exposed the cosmonauts to significant risk in the event of potentially fatal cabin depressurization. This feat would not be repeated until the U.S. Apollo Command Module flew in 1968. This later mission was designed from the outset to safely transport three astronauts in a shirt-leave environment while in space. Between October 14 the Euro 16, 1964, Leonid Brezhnev and a small cadre of high-ranking Communist Party officials, deposed Premier Khrushchev as Soviet government leader a day after Voskhod 1 landed, in what was called the Wednesday Conspiracy. The new political leaders, along with Korolev, ended the technologically troublesome Voskhod program, cancelling Voskhod 3 and 4, which were in the planning stages, and started concentrating on the race to the moon. Voskhod 2 would end up being Korolev's final achievement before his death, as it would become the last of the many space firsts that demonstrated the USSR's domination in spacecraft technology during the early 1960s. According to historian Asif Siddiqui, Korolev's accomplishments marked the absolute zenith of the Soviet space program, one never, ever attained since. There would be a two-year pause in Soviet piloted space flights while Voskhod's replacement, the Soyuz spacecraft, was designed and developed. On March 18, 1965, about a week before the first American piloted Project Gemini space flight, the USSR accelerated the space race competition, by launching the two cosmonaut Voskhod 2 mission with Pavel Bilyeyev and Alexei Leonov. Voskhod 2's design modifications included the first airlock to allow for extravehicular activity, also known as a spacewalk. Leonov performed the first ever EVA as part of the mission. A fatality was narrowly avoided when Leonov's spacesuits expanded in the vacuum of space, preventing him from re entering the spacecraft. He had to improvise and perform the potentially fatal partial depressurization of his spacesuit in order to re enter the airlock. He succeeded in safely re-entering the ship, but he and Bilev faced further challenges when the spacecraft's atmospheric controls flooded the cabin with 45% pure oxygen, which had to be lowered to acceptable levels before re-entry. The re-entry involved two more challenges, an improperly timed retro-rocket firing caused the Voskhod 2 to land 386 kilometers off its designated target area, the town of Perm and the instrument compartment's failure to detach from the descent apparatus caused the spacecraft to become unstable during re-entry. Project Gemini Focused by the commitment to a moon landing, in January 1962 the U.S. introduced Project Gemini, a two-crew member spacecraft that would support Apollo by developing the key spaceflight technologies of space rendezvous and docking of two craft, flight durations of sufficient length to simulate going to the moon and back, extravehicular activity for extended periods, and accomplishing useful work rather than just walking in space. Although Gemini took a year longer than planned to accomplish its first flight, Gemini took advantage of the USSR's two-year hiatus after Voskhod, which enabled the US to catch up and surpass the previous Soviet-led in piloted spaceflight. 
Gemini achieved several significant firsts during the course of ten piloted missions. On Gemini 3, astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom and John W. Young became the first to demonstrate their ability to change their craft's orbit. On Gemini 5, Astronauts L. Gordon Cooper and Charles Pete Conrad set a record of almost eight days in space, long enough for a piloted lunar mission. On Gemini 6A, Command Pilot Wally Shiro achieved the first space rendezvous with Gemini 7, accurately matching his orbit to that of the other craft, station-keeping for three consecutive orbits at distances as close as one foot. Gemini 7 also set a human spaceflight endurance record of 14 days for Frank Borman and James A. Lovell, which stood until both nations started launching space laboratories in the early 1970s. On Gemini 8, Command Pilot Neil Armstrong achieved the first docking between two spacecraft, his Gemini craft and an Agena target vehicle. Gemini 11, commanded by Conrad, achieved the first direct ascent rendezvous with its Ajna target on the first orbit, and used the Ajna's rocket to achieve an apogee of 742 nautical miles, the manned Earth orbit record still current as of August 16, 2014 t 1946. On Gemini 12, Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin spent over five hours working comfortably during three sessions, finally proving that humans could perform productive tasks outside their spacecraft. Most of the novice pilots on the early missions would command the later missions. In this way, Project Gemini built up space flight experience for the pool of astronauts who would be chosen to fly the Apollo lunar missions. Soviet Moon Program The Soviet Union had planned to divide their lunar program into two separate man programs, circumlunar flights in 1967 and lunar landings from 1968. The circumlunar missions were to be launched by a UR-500 rocket, later known as the Proton. The cosmonauts would be flown to the moon in the Soyuz 7 KL-1, which made four unsuccessful unmanned flights between 1967 and 1970. One flight of the Zond was, however, successful and returned its non-human passengers to Earth. Had it been used for a manned circumlunar mission, the flight would have carried two cosmonauts. The Soviet lunar landing missions would use spacecraft derived from the Soyuz 7 KL-1. The orbital module, the Lunya orbital Nico Rabl, had a crew of two. The LOK and a separate lunar lander, the Lunya Co Rabl, had 40% of the mass of the Apollo CS MLM due to the launch vehicle's capabilities. The launch vehicle would have been the N-1 rocket, which was roughly the same height and takeoff mass as the American Saturn V exceeded its takeoff thrust by 28%, and yet had roughly half the TLI payload capability. The N1 was unsuccessfully tested four times, exploding each time due to problems with the first stage's 30 engines. The Soviet leadership cancelled the program in 1970 after the first two successful American moon landings. Fatalities and disasters of the 1960s Probably the worst disaster during the space race was the Soviet Union's Nedlin catastrophe in 1960. It happened on October 24, 1960, when Chief Marshal Mitrofan Nedlin gave orders to use improper shutdown and control procedures on an experimental A-16 rocket. The hasty on-pad repairs caused the missile's second-stage engine to fire straight onto the full propellant tanks of the still-attached first stage. The resulting explosion toxic fuel spill, and fire killed anywhere from 92 to 150 top Soviet military and technical personnel. Marshal Nedlin was vaporized, and his only identifiable remains were his war medals, especially the Gold Star of the Soviet Union. His death was officially explained as an airplane crash. It was also a huge setback for the rocket's chief designer, Mikhail Yangel who was trying to unseat Korolev as the person responsible for the Soviet human spaceflight program. Yangel survived only because he went for a cigarette break in a bunker that was removed from the launch pad, but he would not rival Korolev during the rest of this period. The Nedlin catastrophe would remain an official secret until 1989, and the survivors of the incident were not allowed to discuss it until 1990, 31 years after it occurred. In 1986, in a series of newspaper articles in Izvestia, 
it was disclosed for the first time that the USSR had officially covered up the March 23, 1961 death of Soviet cosmonaut Valentin Bondarenko from massive third-degree burns from a fire in a high-oxygen isolation test chamber. This revelation subsequently caused some speculation as to whether the Apollo 1 disaster might have been averted had NASA been aware of the incident. Bondarenko, at age 24, was the youngest of the early Vostok cosmonauts. The Soviet government erased all traces of Bondarenko's existence in the cosmonaut corps upon his death. In 1967, both nations faced serious challenges that brought their programs to a halt. Both nations had been rushing at full speed on the Apollo and Soyuz programs, without paying due diligence to growing design and manufacturing problems. The results proved fatal to both pioneering crews. In the United States, the first Apollo mission crew, Command Pilot Gus Grissom, Senior Pilot Ed White, and Pilot Roger Chaffee, were killed by suffocation in a cabin fire that swept through their Apollo 1 spacecraft during a ground test on January 27, 1967. The fire was probably caused by an electrical spark. It grew out of control, fed by the spacecraft's pure oxygen atmosphere maintained at greater than normal atmospheric pressure. An investigative board detailed design and construction flaws in the spacecraft, and procedural failings including failure to appreciate the hazard of the pure oxygen atmosphere as well as inadequate safety procedures. All these flaws had to be corrected over the next 22 months until the first piloted flight could be made. Mercury and Gemini veteran Gus Grissom had been a favored choice of Deke Slayton, the grounded Mercury astronaut who became NASA's director of flight crew operations, to make the first piloted landing. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was having its own problems with Soyuz development. Engineers reported 200 design faults to party leaders, but their concerns were overruled by political pressures for a series of space feats to mark the anniversary of Lenin's birthday. On April 24, 1967, the USSR suffered the death of its first cosmonaut, Colonel Vladimir Komarov, the single pilot of Soyuz 1. This was planned to be a three-day mission to include the first Soviet docking with an unpiloted Soyuz 2, but his mission was plagued with problems. Early on his craft lacked sufficient electrical power because only one of two solar panels had deployed. Then the automatic attitude control system began malfunctioning and eventually failed completely, resulting in the craft spinning wildly. Komarov was able to stop the spin with a manual system, which was only partially effective. The flight controllers aborted his mission after only one day, and he made an emergency re-entry. During re-entry a fault in the landing parachute system caused the primary chutes to fail, and the reserve chutes tangled together. Komarov was killed on impact. Fixing these, and other, spacecraft faults caused an 18-month delay before piloted Soyuz flights could resume, similar to the U.S. experience with Apollo. This combined with Korolev's death, led to the quick unraveling of the Soviet moon landing program. Other astronauts died while training for space flight, including four Americans, who all died in crashes of T-38 aircraft. Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, met a similar fate in 1968, when he crashed in a MiG-15 jet while training for a Soyuz mission. During the Apollo 15 mission in August 1971, the astronauts left behind a memorial in honor of all the people, both from the Soviet Union and the United States, who had perished during efforts to reach the moon. This included the Apollo 1 and Soyuz 1 crews, as well as astronauts and cosmonauts killed while in training. In 1971, Soyuz 11 cosmonauts Georgi Dobrovolsky, Viktor Portsev, and Vladislav Vokov asphyxiated during re-entry. To the moon, the United States recovered from the Apollo 1 fire, fixing the fatal flaws in an improved version of the Block 2 command module. The U.S. proceeded with unpiloted test launches of the Saturn V launch vehicle and the lunar module during the latter half of 1967 and early 1968. Apollo 1's mission to check out the Apollo Command Service module in Earth orbit was accomplished by Grissom's backup crew commanded by Walter Schirrer on Apollo 7 launched on October 11, 1968. The 11-day mission was a total success, as the spacecraft performed a virtually flawless mission, 
paving the way for the United States to continue with its lunar mission schedule. The Soviet Union also fixed the parachute and control problems with Soyuz, and the next piloted mission Soyuz 3 was launched on October 26, 1968. The goal was to complete Komarov's rendezvous and docking mission with the unpiloted Soyuz 2. Ground controllers brought the two craft to within 200 meters of each other, then cosmonaut Georgi Beregovoy took control. He got within 40 meters of his target, but was unable to dock before expending 90% of his maneuvering fuel, due to a piloting error that put his spacecraft into the wrong orientation and forced Soyuz 2 to automatically turn away from his approaching craft. The Soviet Zun spacecraft was almost ready for piloted circumlunar missions in 1968, although testing was not yet complete. At the time, the Soyuz 7 KL-1 Zun spacecraft was not yet ready for piloted missions after five unsuccessful and partially successful automated test launches, Cosmos 146 on March 10, 1967. Cosmos 154 on April 8, 1967. Zund 1967 A September 27, 1967. Zund 1967 B on November 22, 1967. Zund 4 was launched on March 2, 1968, and successfully made a circumlunar flight. After its successful flight around the Moon, Zund 4 encountered problems with its Earth re entry on March 9 and was ordered destroyed by an explosive charge 15,000 meters over the Gulf of Guinea. The Soviet official announcement said that Zund-4 was an automated test flight which ended with its intentional destruction, due to its recovery trajectory positioning it over the Atlantic Ocean instead of over the USSR. During the summer of 1968, the Apollo program hit another snag, the first pilot-rated lunar module was not ready for orbital tests in time for a December 1968 launch. NASA planners overcame this challenge by changing the mission flight order, delaying the first LM flight until early 1969, and sending Apollo 8 into lunar orbit without the LM in December on a new Sea Prime mission. This mission was in part motivated by intelligence rumors the Soviet Union might fly a piloted circumlunar Zun flight during late 1968. In September 1968, Zun 5, a Soyuz 7KL-1 spacecraft, with tortoises on board, made a circumlunar flight and returned to Earth, accomplishing the first successful splashdown of the Soviet space program, in the Indian Ocean. It also scared NASA planners as it took them several days to figure out that it was only an automated flight, not a piloted flight with cosmonauts, because voice recordings were transmitted from the craft en route to the moon. On November 10, 1968 another automated test flight of the 7KL-1 spacecraft a Euro Zun 6 a Euro was launched, but this time, it encountered difficulties in its Earth re-entry, and depressurized and deployed its parachute too early causing it to crash land only 16 kilometers from where it had been launched six days earlier. Apollo 8 launched on December 21, 1968, and became the first human crewed spacecraft to leave low Earth orbit and go to another celestial body, the Moon. On December 24 Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders became the first humans to enter into orbit around the Moon. They orbited ten times and transmitted one of the most watched TV broadcasts in history, with their Christmas Eve program from lunar orbit, that concluded with a reading from the King James Bible's Book of Genesis. A few hours later, the crew performed the first ever trans-Earth injection burn, to blast the Apollo 8 spacecraft out of lunar orbit and onto a trajectory back to the Earth. Just over two days later, on December 27, Apollo 8 safely splashed down in the Pacific completing another first, NASA's first dawn splashdown and recovery. It turned out there was no chance of a piloted Soviet circumlunar flight during 1968, due to the unreliability of the Zuns. After the successive launch failures of the N-1 rocket in 1969, Soviet plans for a piloted landing suffered first delay and ultimately cancellation. The launch pad explosion of the N-1 on July 3, 1969 was a significant setback. The rocket hit the pad after an engine shutdown, destroying itself and the launch facility. Apollo 11. 1969 saw the final leg of the moon race, 
with the United States leading it after the flight of Apollo 8. Unbeknownst to the Americans, the Soviet moon program was in deep trouble. Without the N-1 rocket, the USSR had no way to land on the moon. The next two Apollo missions proved that the lunar module worked well, both in low Earth orbit and in lunar orbit. It was time to proceed to an actual landing mission. Under this backdrop, Apollo 11 was being prepared for a July encounter with the Moon. The Apollo 11 crew consisted of Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Edwin Buzz Aldrin. They were selected as the crew in January 1969, and they trained for the mission until just before the actual launch day. On July 16, 1969, at exactly 9.32 a.m. EDT, the Saturn V rocket a Euro serial number SA506 a Euro lifted off from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida with Apollo 11 on board. The lunar trip took just over three days. After achieving orbit, Armstrong and Aldrin transferred into the lunar module, named Eagle, and began their descent. After overcoming several computer malfunctions, Armstrong took over manual flight control at about 180 meters, and guided the lunar module to a landing on the moon's sea of tranquility at 4.17 p.m. EDT, July 20, 1969. The first humans on the moon would wait another six hours before they ventured out of their craft. At 10.56 and 15 seconds of p.m. EDT, Armstrong became the first human to set foot on the moon. The first step was witnessed by at least 500 million TV viewers on Earth. His first words when he stepped off the LM's landing pad were, that's one small step for, a, man, one giant leap for mankind. Aldrin joined him on the surface almost 20 minutes later. Altogether, they spent just under two and one quarter hours outside their craft. The next day, they performed the first launch from another celestial body, and rendezvoused with the Columbia Command Module. Apollo 11 safely left lunar orbit and returned to Earth, landing in the Pacific Ocean on July 24, 1969. When the spacecraft splashed down, 2,982 days had passed since Kennedy committed the United States to landing a man on the moon and bringing him back safely to the Earth before the end of the decade. The mission was completed with just 161 days to spare. With the safe completion of the Apollo 11 mission, the Americans won the race to the moon. This was followed by successful lunar landings on Apollo 12, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, Apollo 16, and Apollo 17. One lunar landing attempt, Apollo 13, was unsuccessful, but the crew returned safely. The 1970s The early 1970s were rounded out by several more U.S. manned moon landings, which featured expanded tasks including more sample returns, experiments, and extended EVAs with a lunar rover. The USSR continued for a time with their N-1 rocket, as well as more Soyuz flights to their Salyut stations. Unmanned spacecraft were in the limelight as well, with the USSR launching unmanned lunar sample return missions and probes to Mars and Venus. The US launched probes to Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter. Saturn, and beyond, as well as launching Skylab, an orbital space station. Together, the US and Soviet conducted an orbital rendezvous by manned spacecraft in 1975. By the end of the 1970s, both were working on space shuttles and launching science missions at a fever pitch. Salyuts and Skylab, having lost the race to the moon, the USSR decided to concentrate on orbital space stations. During 1969 and 1970, they launched six more Soyuz flights after Soyuz 3, then launched the first space station, the Salyut 1 laboratory designed by Karim Karimov, on April 19, 1971. Three days later, the Soyuz 10 crew attempted to dock with it, but failed to achieve a secure enough connection to safely enter the station. The Soyuz 11 crew of Vladislav Vokov, Georgi Dobrovolsky and Viktor Portsev successfully docked on June 7, and completed a record 22-day stay. The crew became the second in-flight space fatality during their re-entry on June 30. They were asphyxiated when their spacecraft's cabin lost all pressure, shortly after undocking. 
the disaster was blamed on a faulty cabin pressure valve, that allowed all the air to vent into space. The crew was not wearing pressure suits and had no chance of survival once the leak occurred. Salyut 1's orbit was increased to prevent premature re-entry, but further piloted flights were delayed while the Soyuz was redesigned to fix the new safety problem. The station re-entered the Earth's atmosphere on October 11, after 175 days in orbit. The USSR attempted to launch a second Salyut class station designated Durable Orbital Station 2 on July 29, 1972, but a rocket failure caused it to fail to achieve orbit. After the DOS-2 failure, the USSR attempted to launch four more Salyut class stations through 1975, with another failure due to an explosion of the final rocket stage, which punctured the station with shrapnel so that it wouldn't hold pressure. While all of the Salyuts were presented to the public as non-military scientific laboratories, some of them were actually covers for the military Olmos reconnaissance stations. The United States also had plans to launch a piloted space laboratory as part of the Apollo applications program, using Apollo hardware. The original plans called for constructing the space laboratory using a spent Saturn SIVB rocket stage, however the space laboratory was ultimately prefabricated on Earth and launched by the modified first two stages of the Saturn V lunar launch vehicle, known as the Saturn INT-21. The orbital workstation Skilab weighed 169,950 pounds, was 58 feet long by 21.7 feet in diameter, with a habitable volume of 10,000 cubic feet. Skylab 1, the mission to actually launch the space station, was launched on May 14, 1973, but was damaged during the flight, losing one of his solar panels and a meteoroid thermal shield. Subsequent human crewed missions repaired the station, and the final mission's crew, Skylab 4, set the space race endurance record with 84 days in orbit, when the mission ended on February 8, 1974. Skylab stayed in orbit another five years before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere over the Indian Ocean and Western Australia on July 11, 1979. Apollo a Euro Soyuz test mission. While the Sputnik 1 launch can be called the start of the space race, its end is harder to pinpoint. In May 1972, President Richard M. Nixon and Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev negotiated an easing of relations known as détente, creating a temporary thaw in the Cold War. In the spirit of good sportsmanship, the time seemed right for cooperation rather than competition, and the notion of a continuing race began to subside. The two nations planned a joint mission to dock the last U.S. Apollo craft with a Soyuz, known as the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. To prepare, the U.S. designed a docking module for the Apollo that was compatible with the Soviet docking system, which allowed any of their craft to dock with any other. The module was also necessary as an airlock to allow the men to visit each other's craft, which had incompatible cabin atmospheres. The USSR used the Soyuz 16 mission in December 1974 to prepare for ASTP. The joint mission began when Soyuz 19 was first launched on July 15, 1975 at 12.20 UTC, and the Apollo craft was launched with a docking module six and a half hours later. The two craft rendezvoused and docked on July 17 at 16.19 UTC. The three astronauts conducted joint experiments with the two cosmonauts, and the crew shook hands, exchanged gifts, and visited each other's craft. After Apollo, in the 1970s, the United States began developing a new generation of reusable orbital spacecraft known as the Space Shuttle, and launched a range of unmanned probes. The USSR continued to develop space station technology with the Salyut program and Mir space station, supported by Soyuz spacecraft. They developed their own large space shuttle under the Buran program. However, the USSR dissolved in 1991 and the remains of his space program were distributed to various Eastern European countries. The United States and Russia would work together in space with the Shuttle Euromir program, and again with the International Space Station. Retrospectives The meaning and nature of the space race are subject to periodic retrospectives in American and other cultures. One such occurrence was in 2003 when Colombia was lost with crew during re-entry. 
Some more retrospectives took place with retirement of the U.S. Space Shuttle program in 2011 and the cancellation of Project Constellation in 2010. Legacy, Advances in Technology and Education, American concerns that they had fallen behind the Soviet Union in the race to space led quickly to a push by legislators and educators for greater emphasis on mathematics and the physical sciences in American schools. The United States National Defense Education Act of 1958 increased funding for these goals from childhood education through the postgraduate level. To this day over 1,200 American high schools retain their own planetarium installations, a situation unparalleled in any other country and a direct consequence of the space race. The scientists educated through these efforts helped develop technologies that have been adapted for use in the kitchen, in transportation systems, in athletics, and in many other areas of modern life. Dried fruits and ready-to-eat foods, stay dry clothing, and even no-fog ski goggles have their roots in space science. Today over a thousand artificial satellites orbit Earth, relaying communications data around the planet and facilitating remote sensing of data on weather, vegetation, and human movements for the nations who employ them. In addition, much of the micro-technology that fuels everyday activities, from timekeeping to enjoying music, derives from research initially driven by the space race. Even with all the technological advances since the first Sputnik was launched, the original Soviet R-7 Semyuka rocket, which marked the beginning of the space race, is still in use today. It services the International Space Station as the launcher for both the Soyuz and Progress spacecrafts. Most notably, during the post-space race era it ferries both Russian and American crews to and from the station. Environment, an unintended consequence of the space race is that it facilitated the environmental movement, as this was the first time in history that humans could see their home world as it really appears a euro. The first color pictures from space showed a fragile blue planet bordered by the blackness of space. Pictures such as Apollo 8's Earthrise, which showed a crescent Earth peeking over the lunar surface and Apollo 17's The Blue Marble, which for the first time ever showed a full circular Earth, became iconic to the environmental movement. The first Earth Day was partially triggered by the Apollo 8 photo. Astronauts returning from space missions also commented on how fragile the Earth looked from space, further fueling calls for better stewardship of the only home humans have a Euro for now. See also Cold War Playground Equipment, Asian Space Race List of space exploration milestones, 1957 a Euro 1969 moonshot space exploration, space flight records, timeline of solar system exploration, timeline of space exploration, timeline of the space race, Woods Hole Conference, Notes. References, Bill Stein, Roger E. Stages to Saturn, A Technological History of the Apollo Saturn Launch Vehicles. Washington. Scientific and Technical Information Branch, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. ISBN A0-16-048909-1A, Brugis, Colin. Kate Doolan. Bert Vista, 1969. Fallen Astronauts, Heroes Who Died Reaching for the Moon. Lincoln, University of Nebraska Press. ISBN A0-8032-6212-4A. Brzezinski, Matthew. Red Moon Rising, Sputnik and a Hidden Rivalries that Ignited the Space Race. New York, Times Books, Henry Holt and Company. ISBN A978-0-8050-8147-1. Burroughs, William E. This New Ocean, The Story of the First Space Age. New York, Random House. ISBN A978-0-679-44000-1. Cadbury, Deborah. Space Race, The Epic Battle Between America and the Soviet Union for Dominance of Space. New York, HarperCollins Publishers. ISBN A978-0-06-084553-7. Chaikin, Andrew. A Man on the Moon. The Triumphant Story of the Apollo Space Program. New York, Penguin Books. ISBN A014027201. Cornwell, John. Hitler's Scientists, Science, War, 
and The Devil's Pact. New York, Viking Press. ISBN A 0 670 0 Delec, Robert. An Unfinished Life, John F. Kennedy, 1917 Euro 1963. Boston, Little, Brown and Company. ISBN A 0 316 17238 3 Gainer, Chris. Arrows to the Moon, Avro's Engineers and the Space Race. Burlington, Ontario, Apogee Books. ISBN A 1 896522 83 1 Gatland, Kenneth. Man Spacecraft, Second Revision. New York, New York, USA. Macmillan Publishing Company, Inc. PPA 100 Euro 101. ISBN A 0-02-542820-9 Hall, Rex. David J. Shaler. The Rocket Men, Vostok and Voskhod, The First Soviet Man Space Flights. New York, Springer A Euro Praxis Books. ISBN A 1 85233 391 Exa, Hall, Rex. David J. Shaler. Soyuz, A Universal Spacecraft. New York, Springer A Euro Praxis Books. ISBN A 1 85233 657 9 Hardesty, Von. Gene Eisman. Epic Rivalry. The Inside Story of the Soviet and American Space Race. Four out by Sergei Khrushchev. Washington, National Geographic Society. ISBN A 978 1 4262019-6. Harford, James J. Korolov, How One Man Masterminded the Soviet Drive to Beat America to the Moon. New York, John Wiley and Sons. ISBN A 0 471 14853 9 Jones, Eric M. Apollo 11 Lunar Surface Journal. Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. Internet. Retrieved August 15, 2010. Craft, Chris. James Skefter. Flight, My Life in Mission Control. New York, Dutton. ISBN A 0 525 94571 7. Murray, Charles. Catherine Bleacox. Apollo, The Race to the Moon. New York, Touchstone. ISBN A 0 671 70625 X. The link is to the 2004 edition, pages differ, but contend the same. A. Uh, Parry, Dan. Moonshot, The Inside Story of Mankind's Greatest Adventure. Chatham, United Kingdom, Ebury Press. ISBN A 978-0-09-192837-7. Palmer, Norman. Timothy M. Lauer. Strategic Air Command, People, Aircraft, and Missiles. Baltimore, Nautical and Publishing Company of America. ISBN A 0 933852 77 0. Poole, Robert. Earthrise How Man First Saw the Earth. New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University. ISBN A 978 0 300 13766 8. Schefter, James. The Race. The Uncensored Story of How America Beat Russia to the Moon. New York, Doubleday. ISBN A 0 385 49253 7. Schmitz, David F. Cold War, Causes. In it at Clay Chambers, John. The Oxford Companion to American Military History. Oxford University Press. ISBN A 0 19 507198 0. Retrieved June 16, 2008. A. Siemens, Robert C., J.R. Findings, Determinations and Recommendations. Report of Apollo 204 Review Board. NASA History Office. Retrieved October 7, 2007. A. Siddiqui, Asif A. Sputnik and the Soviet Space Challenge. Gainesville, 
University Press of Florida. ISBN A0-8130-2627-X. Siddiqui, Asif A. The Soviet Space Race, 1967 Apollo. Gainesville, University Press of Florida. ISBN A0-8130-2628-8. Stocker, Jeremy. Britain and Ballistic Missile Defense, 1942 Euro 2002. London, Frank Case PPA 12 Euro 24. ISBN A 0 7146 5696 8. Turnhill, Reginald. The Moon Landings, an Eyewitness Account. New York, Cambridge University Press. ISBN A 0 521 81595 9. External links. Scan letter from Werner von Braun to Vice President Johnson, America's Space Program. Exploring a New Frontier, a National Park Service Teaching with Historic Places Lesson Plan, Why Did the USSR Lose the Moon Race? From Pravda, December 3, 2002, Space Race Exhibition at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, the Spacerace.com A Euro Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo Space Programs, Timeline of the Space Race to the Moon 1960 A Euro 1969, Shadows of the Soviet Space Age. Paul Lucas, Chronology, Moon Race at Russiornspasiwoop.com, Artwork Representing the Cold War in Space, John F. Kennedy Moon Speech at Rice Stadium and Apollo 11 Mission Video on YouTube.